Okay, the doors are closed. I guess that means we're starting. I was just looking for my friendly marketing person, but she's not here. So, oh, there you are. Excellent. Right, let's go. Okay, so welcome to the final customer track this afternoon. Um, and we've got a great lineup here, as I'm sure you can see. So I'm going to hand over to, to Vicky and some great data leaders here for a discussion on data culture. So over to you, Vicky and team. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us all this afternoon, everybody. Um, I do have a couple of health warnings to issue. The first is that you've got three very passionate data culture colleagues here who we could literally have talked about this topic for the entire three days of uh, possible. So we're going to try hard to cram it into 45 minutes, but I can't make any promises. So I hope you haven't got anywhere else to go afterwards. Health warning number one. Health warning number two, Rob was threatening to sing. He felt like we looked like a bit of a lineup from Westlife or something. So maybe if you stick around for the after party, we might get uh, Rob to do a bit of solo work. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for joining us. So um, I will actually let our guests introduce themselves rather than me introducing them, because what I'd like them to do is also just tell you a little bit about what data culture means to either them or their organisation, because data culture, it's quite a, a broad topic and it means lots of different things to lots of different people. So as the guys introduce themselves, they'll just quickly also tell you what data culture means to them and to their companies. So, Carl, I'll kick off with you. Yeah, we kind of rehearsed this in advance. so. And I was last to answer the questionnaire <laughs> because the guys picked all the brilliant answers. So I'm going to give you their answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so what's what's data culture uh, to uh, to me? Um, it's a it's a mixture of things, and it can be many things to many people as well. Um, for us in Bank of Ireland, it's it's yes, it's about education and capability, um, but we're trying to evolve that into mobilizing people around the asset, getting people to actually do stuff with the skills that they've learned. Um, and how do we enable things like data quality by design at the start of the next new big project? So um, for us, it's really a case of how do we start turn the dial on culture in the business and actually now try and start getting the benefit from getting people data literate, getting people the data skills. And that's that's the big challenge that's now coming up for us over the next few years. Thanks, Carl. Rob, how about yourself? Yes, uh, hi, Rob. Uh, Rob McCormick. Uh, I'm head of data at the Very Group. I've uh, been at Very Group for about six years. I've recently taken on a role, uh, expanded role from head of BI and analytics to uh, more broader head of data. Um, the Very Group, for anyone that doesn't know, is a pure play uh, multi category retailer. Uh, we have three brands, very.ie. Um, which is our Irish business and two UK businesses of littlewoods.com and very.co.uk. Uh, about 4.4 million customers and we're quite unique in terms of the retail space where we offer a wraparound financial services offering which is integrated as part of that retail offering um, in, in the organisation. So in terms of data culture, we, because of the uniqueness of our business and the heritage of our business, um, we have an amazing um, data capability in terms of the quality and the quantity of the data that we have um, and ensuring that we uh, maximize the use of that data but we do it in an ethical way and our strategy is how do we help customers get more out of life and very much in terms of using our data to ensure that we uh, provide the right options to our customers uh, at, at the right time equally also in terms of enabling our colleagues um, to make their role as easy as possible and use the data as a key component of that. Fantastic, thanks Rob. Kaylee, last but not least. Hi everyone, I'm Kaylee O'Dwyer. So I'm a senior manager for data analytics, cultural and strategy at Lloyds Banking Group. So I've been there for about four and a half years. Um, data culture for me is very much about having a, a, is a movement. It's not just a thing that you can measure that's really, really tangible, but when it happens, you can really feel it. Um, often in Lloyds, I refer to it as the our data culture renaissance. You know, we are bringing this really future tech and the dynamic and rapid moving world around us into 250 years worth of data and processes and bringing those two things together. It's all well and good if it's one person shouting about it, but as soon as you start to get lots of people shouting about data, you're creating that movement. And for me, that is what data culture is about. It's that movement together. Yeah. 
Absolutely, a lot of synergies there from what you guys have said. Um, and I know each of you are on, all of your organisations are in slightly different positions of your journey to shifting the dial, shall we say, at data culture within within your operations. But um, I'm sure that through the, the next set of questions, we'll see a lot of a lot of parallels and a lot of similarities. Um, but if we could just start, and I won't come to you first this time, Carl, because I don't want you nicking their answers again, OK? Um, so I'm going to go to Rob first this time. Um, but Rob, if you could talk a little bit about what some of those challenges have been for your organisation in trying to shift that dial and, and make that transition um, on the data culture journey. Yeah, I think uh, from a challenging point of view, we have, uh, we have, as you said, we have a lot of data, we have a lot of technology wrapped around our data. So at times it can be um, fatigue in terms of within that, within the enterprise, um, and knowing when, which is, which, which product or which service is the right one to use at the right time for the, for the right thing. Um, I think the clear, the, the necessity of having a clear data strategy, um, and it's one thing having a data strategy that from a, from a technology perspective or from a data perspective, that is, means a lot for everyone within the data office, um, but translating that and communicating that on a consistent and regular basis within, across the enterprise, so people can relate to that in terms of their day-to-day -day -day job, as well as obviously ensuring all the architecture that underpins and support that is right. So it's almost like multi layers of that data strategy and making sure you land that communication in the right way, I think is, is, is a challenge in an organization that's constantly evolving and moving. Absolutely, to enact any change, you've got to have people's buy-in, haven't you? And there's only going to be that buy-in if they can understand what's, what, how this is going to make their life better and different faster. Absolutely. Yeah, cool, thanks Rob. Kaylee. Yeah, so I completely resonate with the fact around knowing what tech and there's multiple tech options. Um, I think a big thing for us is around access. I think that's always a really big challenge, knowing when people can access data and what data they should access. And should everyone access all data um, and trying to make those decisions at the right time, especially when you have a multitude of systems and there are risks involved in that. Um, another challenge that I often see is is around that that buy-in not just around knowing what it is or knowing that data is important but actually thinking about okay I'm bought in what is my responsibility and what do I need to do now to drive that change and we all talk or everyone talks about having that buy-in at a senior level but I think it definitely goes both ways and having people understand that data is part of their journey and it is part of their job for everybody is is a challenge and um, yeah we're doing lots to tackle that uh, at right as well at the moment thanks okay now carl probably a lot of the same but what else yeah. have you got in your, your yeah. challenge space um, well we, we have the exact same challenges um, uh, and i guess the, the soul of piece is is, is is a really big one for us um, and the culture is really the culture is really interesting in when, when you work for any bank that's over 200 years of age and some of the people are probably at the same age um, they have very they have very strict views on certain things you know um, but for, for us what um, in terms of the so what we're trying to think about how we can make it part of everyone's day-to-day -day digital diet or whatever you want to talk about to think about what's important with data data quality you know um, I don't care that Carl Kane's name is spelled wrong and this current account application form I'm filling in I'm just gonna fill it in and go and I've done I've made the sale you know and um, I don't really know what the downstream implications are but I, I'm moving on I know here for so the big challenge for us now is trying to get people to, to understand how easy it is to do things right first time um, and the downstream impact of that um, and maybe even trying to f find a way to uh, enhance their career as well because we're back into a place where we're, we're, we're profit sharing again we're not state owned um, there's not bonuses coming but there's definitely performance um, uh, uh, performance indicators coming which might impact whatever your salary is at the end of the year etc um, and we want to try and create a culture where we're incentivizing people to actually do things that are going to say minimize data risk and make easier processes you know um, and that's 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 kind of a challenge at the moment but that's a challenge that 
we're actually now starting to hit full force for the next three year cycle. Which brings us nicely on to what are we doing about some of these challenges. So Kaylee, do you want to kick us off with some of the innovations and ideas and creative suggestions that are coming through from the Lloyd's side on how to shift the dial on some of these things? Yeah, definitely. And I think going back to that, that point around senior buy-in, data and data culture are now very big parts of our group strategy. Um, we talk about it a lot. Charlie talks about it quite uh, explicitly in, in all of his talks. We have visions set around data about becoming one of the most data literate banks in the world you know that is in in our strategy and also pivoting to a position where we are using data to help britain prosper and having those in place has really helped to start change that mindset at the top um, and starting to put, allow sorry starting to allow people to put metrics in place that can help drive towards that Another um, thing that we're doing to overcome the challenge is we've got really strong strategic workforce plans, thinking about what are the kind of skills we're going to need next year and the year after, thinking about how we grow our graduate scheme, bringing in uh, the youth and all of the great skills in through that program and continuing to develop them into the business. Um, another then set of areas are around our internal capability uplift. I think I was saying to somebody earlier, people are probably sick of me saying it, but we've run um, a summer school over an eight week period. It was 150 courses, all data uh, focused. We had them all delivered by internal colleagues. So everyone got to use their great minds and share their skill sets. Now, for a company of about 65,000 colleagues, we had 44,000 signups across all of these courses. Um, really, really strong ratings, really strong learning outcomes. And it allowed people to dip their toe into data without feeling overwhelmed, without, being, without you know, having the opportunity to ask questions and just find out more. And these courses were great because they ranged from really light touch intros to tools, to solutions and systems and to concepts as well as going then really in depth on how to code Python or SQL or use Power BI, whatever the flavor of tool is that they were learning about and really, really digging into that, that level of detail. So it's a really great concept. And we've also followed that up with some strong masterclasses as we've been calling them, that we've been delivering out to our top 300. So top 300 people across the group having really in-depth sessions on Gen AI, on data products, so that, that knowledge is really landing at all levels of the group. And I think that's the, the biggest piece that we're doing around driving that culture. I think that's really important, the point you make there about it's through all of the levels of the organisation. So you've actually got your leaders leading by example mm -hmm. and taking the plunge on some of these topics and getting their hands dirty and getting into the detail uh, in a way that perhaps they haven't before. So yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Carl, I know uh, you, you've got some similar similar trains. Yeah, yeah, we've very, very similar uh, stuff in place in terms of the education and uh, the community pieces, like the, the masterclass and things like that. Um, and, and for, for us, what, we're, we're not really getting the, the effect of, we, we have a capability program which can take people from fluency, literacy, right up to uh, a situation where we'll actually fund them to become a data analyst by teaching them the, the skills, SQL, Tableau, Python, um, and then the foundational knowledge of the obvious stuff, GDPR, you know, data privacy, all this kind of stuff. Um, but then when we're getting to a place where we have to get them to start doing stuff is, is the gap. So uh, what we're actually looking at now is um, we've kind of done some digging, trying to understand what, what exactly is going on. And of course, when people go to college and they're learning the SQL skills and, and the Python skills, they're, they're given the perfect database. Um, and there's one Carl Kane in there. It's not correctly. Several. Spelled yeah. correctly, yeah. Spelled yes. Spelled correctly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, if there's two or three Carl Kanes, they're all completely different people, different addresses. There's not one Carl Kane with three different dates of birth. Um, this kind of stuff. So what we're actually focused on now is more of a, an, an, an academy, a top gun, if you will, where we want to actually take the guys that we, 
we spent a lot of money on um, and say, listen, we're going to take you into this. I don't like using the word accelerator. The banks, they don't like startup words. Um, you lose funding as soon as you start talking that way. <laughs> um, so an academy um, where we're actually bringing the guys in, we have some of our enterprise data warehouse siphoned off. So these guys are now going to be funneled into an academy. Um, I have uh, product leads for each of the, the key priority areas and the tools within those areas, like data profiling, data quality. Um, we'll have a Teradata stream. Um, there could be uh, metadata, data lineage. Basically, all of the stuff from a regulatory point of view that's going to be coming down the line over the next couple of years. So I can, if I can get people focused on those things, then we kind of have a production line for when the regulator says, that's what has to be done in December. And if it's not done, it's a million euro. So what are you going to do? Instead of mobilizing a uh, big consultancy around the problem, we're going to start mobilizing our own people. So that's where I think we're going to see the benefit of this, this economy. Okay. If it works. It will. Have faith. Mm -hmm. It will. I'll help you. It'll work. <laughs> Rob, we're in a slightly different industry, although I know, as you said, you have your financial services arm as well. But are you, what are you doing in your space? Are you doing anything differently? Uh, so, uh, just to echo everything that's been said and to try and build on that. Um, wow, I mean, so much. How long have we got? Mm. Um, I think feel really, really privileged actually in terms of very, is very forward organized, looking organization in terms of data. I think there's always room for improvement. Um, so I think we've been on a, a great journey over the last three years. Um, I mentioned about the, the need and the importance of having a data strategy that resonates with many, many different audiences. Um, I'll start with that. So we've got four pillars in our data strategy that we talk to, which is data, insight, action, underpinned by trust. It's not rocket science. Um, we over-index on the trust pillar. So we want to ensure that we have you know, the right architecture and capability within our data pillar. We want those right insights. But if we're not let, getting the value from that through through our action, with various different channels, it, it can all be sort of for nothing. Um, and obviously, that needs to be underpinned by our trust and governance and compliance. Uh, area and we talk consistently and we have done over the last three years around that I think we've also moved probably from a state of maybe analysis paralysis mm. uh, we, we democratize data because of the culture within the organization so again very forward focused um, and actually they were everyone was invested and wanted to use data and I think probably some of the things maybe that we didn't do is we did that without that data strategy being fully understood and the value of that, and that's where that analysis paralysis come in through the organization. And a little bit of that tech fatigue I talked about yeah. as well. Um, so staying true to, to that strategy, going a little bit deeper down into, into the strategy is a hub and spoke model, partnering with different components of the business and decentralized, centralized capabilities. And we've landed on a really good balance of how we work with our partners across the organization uh, and giving them the, the guidance and support to go away and be innovative, but linking that back into the components of, of the strategy. Um, and to do that with many things that we can talk about doing that. One is our data academy, which has been talked about as well. We've recently part, partnered with a uh, third party called Multiverse and um, helping leverage in our apprenticeship levy to um, move um, our, our data professionals and adjacent data professionals in that spoke model to, to get a, a certified qualification through that program. So it's been really rewarding. Um, we're at an early stage in terms of that, uh, but we, we want to further, further, further adopt it. Um, so yeah, lo lots of lots of great things going on and how we're moving forward with that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to ask one more question from, from my list and then I'll open it up to the floor for any questions. So get thinking now, that's your warning folks, get ready with your question. Can't say you haven't been warned. Um, so yeah, my final question, and, and we sort of touched on it slightly in one of the um, earlier responses, but technology, and, and Kaylee, you mentioned the pace of change within data generally, but with the technology that we're using in the data space. So technology can be a force for good. It can also be a bit of a hindrance sometimes, heaven forbid. So I'm just intrigued for your organizations with your movement to shifting the dial on data culture. Are you seeing instances where tech, AI, any form of technology is helping and you're being able to use that to sort of further what you're doing in the data culture space? Or is it having the opposite effect? Because actually it's creating a whole bunch of challenge over keeping people keeping pace. So Kaylee, can I, can I come to you first with that one? Of course, yeah, yeah. And I think one of the biggest things, and it's a help and a hindrance, is the hype. 
the the everyone is talking about data um, and particularly focused on AI, Gen AI, and dare I say it, the new sort of buzzwords of the of the time, right? And we will sort of go through these troughs, but those that hype is absolutely fantastic this time around. It's been really, really helpful in driving that because we are seeing areas within the business, but also areas outside of our business doing wonderful things with data. And it's really well known now how powerful that can be. Um, I think there is also starting to see a lot of people just want, they want to be in the data world. They want to be in data worlds. They want to have that as part of their key skills. So people are getting really bought in. I think there are some instances where it can be slightly less helpful. People are very excited and they try to run before they can walk. And I think we talked about it a lot yesterday. They try and aim for that thing that is really big when they should have just aimed for something that was a little bit smaller, got that right, and then expanded and continued that build. And I think we still see a lot of people going for that end goal first and not thinking about scaling back. Um, and that comes with a lot of education and, and awareness. And I think the last thing that I think has been really, really helpful is because it's become so prominent, there are lots of uh, focuses around the ethical use of our data now yeah. and how we're using it. And particularly in the financial sector, you know, we're very risk averse in those kind of instances. You, know, you want to be very safe with your data. And the fact that ethics is so prominent and we're talking about it all the time and educating people on it has been such a help because it's helped to pivot to that safe zone of how we can use this data and how we can really get the most out of it. So I think that's been a really great push that the hype has given us. Yeah, no, that's good. So you, the colleagues that you're trying to inform are actually motivated to be exactly. informed um, because of the prevalence outside of the work life, you know, in the home life as well, of, of yeah, of Gen IA and ethics. It's topics that we're familiar with more and more. No, yeah. that's great. Thanks, Katie. Carl, your turn. I'm going to come to you. Uh, yeah, almost exactly the same. <laughs> Two big um, banks with lots of heritage yeah. and lots of history. I mean, you guys have got a lot in common. <laughs> so uh, accessibility is a big deal for us, giving people access to the asset. And the initial worry was that, you know, with, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and people are just going to go mad and start uploading everything um, and throwing on, like other stuff on top of stuff and cross-referencing data sets and all that kind of thing and basically not good in the GDPR world. But the the interesting thing, uh, now AI is coming down the line fast. Um, we are not mobilized around AI or Gen AI really yet. All of the, uh, we, we're starting to set up governance forums around this um, and those forums are not even talking about what you can do with AI they're more saying what you don't do yeah that is it we're not saying listen this is the logic you use if you're smart you upload that you use this logic and there's your interview answers um, we're not going that far uh, in case someone actually uploads something to a cloud that has customer details in there that we can't get back so uh, we're going very heavy on this and we, we recognize that this is there um, but if you're stupid enough to do something stupid we're coming after you um, and that's there's, there's a, a hesitancy now after coming up literally in the last month or so around okay we need to start maybe we've probably gone heavy on what not to do maybe we start now pivoting into so listen you know what not to do but if you want to really start maximizing this tech, do it this way, you know, um, or be patient because we'll have our own cloud at some stage and maybe we're going to start training you for that. So it's a really interesting space. There's, there's like a hesitancy at the moment. Yeah, a hesitancy. But it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, the next few uh, months and years I think are going to yeah. be very interesting, mm -hmm. aren't they? So it all plays out. Rob? Yeah, I think building those on some of the points. Um, we, we probably, from a Gen AI perspective, AI perspective, we've moved on to talk about that and follow the theme. Um, we, we're probably guilty of locking people out to begin with, the fear of uh, of that. And actually, where we've ended up is, uh, we've done many things actually. So we had a, a 
an immersion day in a whole conference that took over the organization all on AI and the capability of it, uh, which really helped in terms of, you know, in my career, I've never been in an organization that's basically down tools and talked about data, which is ultimately what we were doing. And the hype around Gen AI has driven that, and ultimately we were having conversations about data quality, governance, all those things that you would not be talking about, suddenly you are talking about. So we really moved on from that, so that was a great place to be. And, and one of the things that we come from that was showcasing all of the capability that was available at that point in time and putting that in front of every colleague in the organization. So we very much believe that we're, 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 we're driving a lot of the capability, but actually the use of that capability is going to come from within the organization and find the balance. So we created a, an AI incubator so we can give people that freedom to innovate, but actually give the right um, guardrails around yeah. it. <laughs> um, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Just retail. Um, well, I was going to say you've already mentioned how forward thinking we are. So it, you, you. Get, it gets worse. And, <laughs> and and one of the things that when we first started off is no one used ChatGPT. Uh, and you've, well, I'm sure you're all familiar with the horror stories where people have put confidential inf information in, 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 into, into the models. So actually, what we've done is we created our own version called Very GPT. Uh, which is the same version, but within our domain. Um, and we've rolled that out so everyone now has access to, to use that, but the data stays within, within our organization. Um, and there's lots of other use cases where we're using technology to innovate, using some of it, like, is it, is it Gen AI, is it AI, or is it traditional sort of ML capability that we've got, whether that's our forecasting capability, uh, image recognition through product descriptions, it's a huge area of growth for us in terms of getting the right um, um, image descriptions for our, for our, for our products um, and we sell a lot of products so that is a big problem um, and a big opportunity in terms of getting right descriptions and using AI to do that but also then optimizing our search engine optimization process as a consequence of having good metadata so surrounded with it. Um, but actually for me and, and one of the, the areas that I'm really focused on looking at technology to solve is all of that's great and it's amazing and but actually, a lot of people say to me, could you just make my Monday trading reports? Could you just write that for me? Um, because I spend an hour on a 7 a.m. On a, on, a, on a Monday morning, sometimes on a Sunday evening. And actually, can, can I just get that by typing it into very GPT? Yeah. Not there yet with that, because there's some, we were looking at that and there's different products on the market. But that's a way of technology I think will really, it's not that glamorous. In terms of the use cases, but I think if we were to deliver that successfully, I think the value that we'd get from that from those individuals, I think would be really transformational in terms yeah. of the time they get back, and that will really satisfy them. So. It's that value focus, isn't it? I think, and we heard a lot about that on the stage this morning in the opening um, sessions. It's you know, we shouldn't be taking the approach of build it and they shall come. We should be yeah. building for purpose for the for our customers with our users in mind things that they want and they're actually going to make their life better. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Fantastic. Right, well, you were warned. You were warned that it was question time. So over to you, beautiful people. Any questions from the room? Pensive, pensive faces. Go on, you've got one. Yeah. Go, go so, on. So, uh, Katie, you talked about your summer data camp and measuring the number of attendees and things that you've got there. Does the team have any other examples of metrics that you might be tracking in terms of your data policy? Time. Yeah, so as I said, you know, data culture is that movement, isn't it? It's, it's hard to make tangible. So we are doing a huge amount of work on understanding where people's skills are, how they're improving, but not just if you've learned something, if you've gone on a data literacy course. It's actually, are you then using that? Are you then using those tools? Because it's very easy to tick a box and say, we've, we've given everybody uh, a basic intro to uh, a code or a, or a visual solution. But actually, if only two people out of a thousand are then using that, was that course even, in, even useful? And we're starting to look at how we measure that and then assessing the maturity against what that looks like. So we're early on that journey of changing these stats from measuring attendance 
and skills levels and um, accessibility, accessibility rates, etc., and turning that into, okay, and now what are they doing? How can we see that tangible output of that change? How do we know that there's maturity? And maturity looks different for everybody, and I think that's something that we need to contend with. I know as a, as a bank, you'll probably resonate this, but you'll have the same in, in retail. You'll have different departments. You know, does every department need to be you know, a level 10 out of 10 in everything data? Or are they okay to be at a four because their needs are different? They don't access that much. And trying to contend with that balance as well is something that we are looking at and thinking about how can we tackle that to make it fit the purpose rather than push everybody to be at a skill level and at a maturity level, they don't need to be at. Thank you. Great, great question. Great answer. <laughs> got, oh, got a couple on the floor. Brilliant. Thanks, Ed. Oh, and a third one. Great. All right. Yeah, go ahead, James. Sorry. Hi. Um, so thanks so far for the um, debate. Um, I have a question. Data culture, so it's quite wide ranging in scope, and cultural change takes time. So when you're deciding priorities, what's the initial priority to begin that transformation, to begin that change? Okay, yeah, go for it. Um, well, for, for us, everything is tied back to the strategy, um, and in particular, the data strategy. So uh, the data quality piece that I talked a little bit about um, is, 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 is we're, do, we're doing that on purpose. That's by design. So. Uh, bank has to mobilize itself around the quality of data and, and what is the quality of data. Um, we have the, the priority data in the businesses, like most businesses, name, address, email, phone, I think consent, five or six, generally the same. Um, and we are trying to understand how we can now mobilize people around those particular data points to help us improve. And that actually aligns to the business strategy. So as well as having uh, the capability and the fluency. We have like a number of different points in terms of data culture. We have all the education, the capability. Um, there's uh, data by design. So when new projects come in, you know, the, the obvious stuff is done at source. Like, is there an owner for this thing when we build this? And is that owner in the bank or are they a consultant? Because it can't be a consultant. Like, we have a bunch of stuff that's happening. Um, around in terms of our data culture and connections with the asset um, and accessibility to the asset. Um, but the big thing is now, how can we actually start crowdsourcing? Um, uh, crowdsourcing stuff that the regulator is going to come in looking for over the next couple of years. And that all aligns with the actual business strategy. And we're finding now we're actually getting a lot of, uh, a lot of kudos for that because believe it or not, for whatever reason, a lot of projects in, in corporates of, of our age, they kind of just operate in silo and they forget about the strategy. They forget that the CEO was on the news a couple of weeks ago talking about, listen, we are trying to do this. And then you're looking at this deck and it's trying to do something else. It's just, it's an unfortunate kind of thing that happens, you know. And um, But that's where leadership comes in. So the leaders are supposed to go, well, hang on a sec, that's not the strategy. I don't know where you got that from. Align into the strategy and then we can talk. Thanks, thanks, James. Well back. Hi. Um, so I suppose my question is kind of more on the other end of uh, data culture because data culture affects the entire business. But I think sometimes what uh, data departments complain about is they can deliver insight to other departments that brings a lot of ROI, but they're not very much, um, how can I say, spotlighted for that. So, you know, the marketing team delivers a great campaign and Thank you very much, marketing. We've made so much profit, but actually it's data that drove this. Another very group is doing something with um, the Hubbard Spoke model to help them communicate that internally. But I just want to ask all of you guys, you know, how are you communicating the ROI that you bring into the business and trying to promote that, the benefits of a great data culture around your businesses? Do you, yeah, do you want to cover what Very are doing first? Because I obviously my bay knows that everyone else doesn't. So yeah, and then yeah. you guys can add on if there's anything else. It's, it's probably two parts. Two parts of the answer. One is very much the role that we do in the Very Group is we are enabler across the organisation, and sometimes you have to be comfortable with that. That we enable great things to happen in our marketing team, and we don't always get the credit for it. 
Um, and that's just that's just that's just where we are. That that is life. Um, however, it's around that partnership um, and ensuring that um, it, that we we ensure that that value that we are underpinning is is done in partnership, and we're not just that enabling piece behind the scenes. There's many examples in very at the moment. Yesterday we, we launched a, a, a new component to our organization called Retail Media, a very retail media group. And um, retail media is a, is a, is a huge um, component for us as an organization. It's huge for retail. It's, it's really big in the US. It's, it's, it's a growing market in the UK. Um, and we've been doing it for some time. Uh, but actually what we launched yesterday is just really getting serious and, and further evolving that. Um, we have a a rich, a rich asset of data, um, first party data, which is becoming more and more scarce now. So retailers, um, uh, suppliers are more dependent on retailers, retailers to do that. So that partnership with our, with our marketing team and how we, how we leverage that, um, very much is the data strategy that's enabling that, that, that's that in the forward. Yeah, I think I would, I would add to that. So we, we've actually built into our data culture team, a, uh, a group of the team that are called our data um, engagement team and they are heavily focused on working across the group in making sure that they are getting those data stories that those data stories are getting the uh, publication that they need um, and I'm not going to say that was easy because it was very difficult because as much as people want their story of data to be shouted about they also want to hold that in their silo. Back to your point about silos, right? They like to hold on to that story. So over the last sort of nine months to a year, it's been a really long journey about getting people on side with that and starting to think about the, the collaboration. How can we set to share that? How can I showcase data in, in everything that we do? So I work really closely with our with our MDs to, to make sure that we are always talking about that and bringing that to the forefront of our conversations. And for anybody that follows myself or any of our data culture team on it, on LinkedIn, they, it is nonstop. Yeah, yeah. It is everything that's getting plugged all the time. And that has been a huge shift, a difficult shift, but one that we've all got on board with. And now we're starting to see others across the group do the same, which is fantastic. You know, we are seeing our MDs post on LinkedIn about their data journey, which is great. And that's that's really changing the way. Yeah. And actually that's something we didn't touch on too much in, in what we've talked about today, but I think that the power of storytelling is significant. You and I have spent a bit of time, haven't we, talking about that, Carl? Um, so yeah, I think that that's a great point that you make. There was another, I'm just conscious of time, and I know there was another question on this side of the room. Yes, would you, sorry, um, Alva, would you be able to grab a mic over there? Thank you. I can hear the applause next door, which is making me think, oh my God, we need to finish. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing real world uh, experience insights in the data culture journey. Uh, I think when, when people talk about data culture, uh, a slogan or cliche people talk about is turning data into assets rather than cost center. And I think the panel started to touch on that. And I was just wondering whether it remains a uh, aspiration in your organization or do you, uh, are you already in a journey? Do you have any specific examples of trying to instill that, uh, the failures and lessons learned uh, that you can share with, with us? Thank you. Great question. Yeah, turning data into assets rather than cost. Have you guys got any, any good in, insight on that? A couple of examples of maybe what we've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, brilliant. So uh, in, in, in most banks, the, the, it's filled with paper-based process for that still. Um, and, and it's a little bit through choice, you know, because a lot of the time you'll find, so you'll pick something up in a branch somewhere and you'll see people doing something. Oh, what is that? What's that thing you're doing? You know, and you could be like the dot matrix printer and someone's red pen in it and, and so, what is that? You know? And they just say, Well, this is all transaction reporting from the ATM from the previous day. You have to have a quick look through. A quick look through this. <laughs> and red pen, anything that might be suspicious. <laughs> How do you know what's suspicious or not on this 
there's one column saying transaction number and there's another column saying amount. And you've written in suspicious stuff where you don't have any more context. So people are kind of just going, well, I'm doing it anyway. And the less red pen I use, the less time I'm going to spend on that computer over there checking all this shit. So I'll red pen two things at random. And in amongst all those thousands of transactions, there's probably genuinely something very suspicious in there, or several very suspicious things. But that's an example of processes that are there because people can't question it. Because that printer prints this thing out before we even get, get here every Monday morning. It's just waiting for me there and I'll have a go and you know, do whatever. So we actually looked at the process, you know, and the justification for the process. Uh, yes, it's to find suspicious transactions. Um, so anything, I think, the, the policy or the, not policy, uh, the procedures is anything above 5,000 euro uh, generally needs to be checked, which is pain, right? But that procedure was made, I think, in the 90s. <laughs> Whereas very few people were lodging five grand into an ATM uh, or taking five grand out of one. Um, so we worked with uh, people in the branch network to try and understand what the, what it should be. Listen, let's pretend you're doing this the right way and looking at all, everything above five grand. Right? Let's pretend that to start off with here because we know you're not. Um, tell us the logic that that, that, that is suspicious. Okay, well, if there's someone that owns an account that is like, you know, 150 years of age and they're still taking out five grand, that's a bit dodgy. You might want to check that, you know. If there's an account where there's people lodging money to it of five grand or more and this person actually isn't due to be born yet for another year, you might want to look at that as well. So we work to try and understand all of that logic. Um, and there was a bunch of other stuff. And stuck it, stuck, stuck it, we ran the logic into our enterprise data warehouse on transaction analysis, stuck it onto the top of the dashboard, and we basically said, listen, forget about that report, check these five transactions. So we, we, we started doing that um, and using it in the branch network. Um, and every transaction that our logic is identifying is suspicious and has actually gone straight to the police. Um, not to mention the fact that that paper-based thing was being printed off at every branch in the country automatically. Um, and when you kind of keep probing, the process isn't being followed. But if it was being followed, it probably takes someone two weeks to look at one day's transactions. So basically bringing the data people to the business, uh, to the business people in that situation, um, mitigate a hell of a lot of risk in the business. Saved a fair few trees as well, by the sounds of it. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so it's a small example, and those types of things are all over the place. You know? But if those branch people, if we could get the branch people to understand a little bit of their data fluency, um, a little understanding of how data travels across the organization, and what people do with it, they won't need someone like me to come in and just look at the obvious. You know, they, they can actually come up with success. Empower the business to make the right decisions based on data. Absolutely, that's data culture right there, in a nutshell. Fantastic. Any other questions? I think we've got about 60 seconds left. Oh, yep. Um, do any of your organizations give the business units access to your data warehouse? Like, does somebody in marketing have access to your data? Does somebody in finance um, access the data? Or do you just have specific data departments? If you do give business units access to your data, do you have any kind of framework or checks or governance around that? Thanks, Helen. You talked a little bit about democratization of data, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, is the short answer. Um, yes to all of that. Um, so we 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 uh, went through quite a big program of um, uh, self serve the I tool and deploying that, and and really sort of partnered with the with the organisation. So. Hub and spoke about what I talked about before. We have a, a level of capability within our finance team, and we work very closely with them in sort of that center of excellence or hub capability to enable them to, to um, augment and build on the central uh, capability. Um, so the need for a 
financial colleague needing to go and run a query against directly against our data warehouse is very rare. Um, but if that if they were to need that, they would go to their the colleague in that finance domain, um, and often we would try and use our self serve analytics tool as a mechanism of preventing, well not preventing, but trying to stop direct SQL coming in um, into that. Um, so they can, it's the reusability of that. But equally, if they did need to run a query um, against our data warehouse, that, that, that capability could do that. Uh, but we would work with them in terms of when that's good to do, when that's not good to do. Um, and that's that governance of framework around that operate model that, that, that comes into it. And that, and that works well. So we've empowered people and given people a level of autonomy. But we've also given them those guardrails and structure yeah. around that of what good looks like. And, you know, there's, do we always get it right in terms of, you know, we're being too restrictive and saying you should use the central creative finance reporting and you can you should never build your own version. I don't think that quite works. It needs to be give and take flexibility and we meet regularly with all our spokes to ensure actually what's working well and what's not working well and if we've got the degree of control and power in the right in the right place. Okay, there's a very similar setup at Lloyd's, isn't there, with the self serve through the Power BI and yeah. Tableau dashboards. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, completely the same sort of hub and spoke, centres of excellence and then access to that and trying to stop you know, that sort of roguenness of people wanting to go away and build in their own silo and try and bring it all into a more focus point with the right guardrails, as you said. That is key, I think, the, the guardrails that, that are put in place. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you for the question. And I think that's time, isn't it? Draws, yeah. draws our, our time to a close. So thank you, Vicky, Kaylee, Carl and Rob. What a great session. Um, you know the drill. Evaluate the session. And many thanks to the team. Um,